Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. What is up? Welcome to the GSMC Football Podcast on a Monday today here. My name is Tom Doherty, which means this is the college football edition of the GSMC Football Podcast. As always, this podcast is brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. As uh, we get in here on a Monday now, the NBA draft is over. We're kind of in the middle of a no man's land in sports world. Um, baseball, obviously, going on. We got full, the World Cup, th- uh, good thing. Obviously, that's only for four years. But there's always stuff to talk about when it comes to our uh, nation's one of our, well, if they're our nation's favorite sport, football, right? And uh, re- one of the reasons why we know we love the NFL is because of the the strength of college football and the ability for uh, college uh, college teams and college towns to grow and come together during football season or even during the off season and uh, still root on uh, their favorite teams, uh, whether it's down in Tuscaloosa, whether it's up in Seattle, Washington, or it's uh, across in Syracuse, in Syracuse, New York, or down in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, or Tucson, Arizona. So, I mean, it's across the country. It's all over the place. We have five power uh, conferences. I've gone through all the coaches of those conferences in the last, over the last week or and a half. Uh, we did the Pac-12 coaches, or I mean, the Big 12 coaches on Friday um, was the last conference to go through with that. So I uh, to give a little thoughts on every coach. I do have a couple favorites. Obviously, they can probably go through and rank a couple coaches, but I actually do that during the during the second segment. We're going to rank. We might rank all those coaches. I'll give my top ten when it comes to uh, coaches right now in college football. Only three actually have national champions under their. Uh, now, actually, no. Is it four? It's four. Four coaches that are active right now actually have national championships under their belt. Saban, uh, obviously, one of them. Nick Saban. You got Dabo Swinney over in Clemson. Jimbo Fisher's got one, but he's a Texas A and M now. He's no longer with the team he won a championship with and then you have urban meyer uh who's won with both florida and at ohio state uh where he is now so uh, you got you got some talent out there obviously got some coaches that are trying to prove some stuff whether it's jim harbaugh uh whether it's chip kelly now i mean i think he's he's fine he's got a he's got a bit of a buffer zone i think right now when it comes to uh ucla and their their success right out of the gate with uh, chip kelly and him taking over that job for jim morris so He'll probably have a little bit of leeway, but uh, as far as it comes to proving yourselves, obviously Kirby Smart proved himself last year uh, in his first year to get to a college football playoff, and then into the national championship game where he's in the, within a play away of making of winning the national championship game in his first year at Georgia with a freshman quarterback. All these different things. Obviously, he has uh, some really good talent on the had some really good talent um, behind uh, his rookie quarterback. I mean, his freshman quarterback and with his running backs, uh, he'll still have some good talent this year with DeAndre Swift. Love DeAndre Swift. And uh, looking, that'll definitely help uh, Georgia get back to where they were last year. I'm assuming because I mean, they're in the SEC. Really, obviously, you got to when you're Georgia and Alabama, and pretty much you only have to worry about. I mean, Alabama, Alabama, yeah, you have to worry about um, Auburn, but Georgia is over there in the other side, in, the, in that other division, and they're like, hmm, we just have to basically beat North Carolina. I mean, sorry, South Carolina and Florida to get in the front of our, in our division uh i mean in the in the west side you got alabama and texas a&m you got lsu i mean they're kind of down right now obviously still kind of having to f- figure out where they're coaching i mean ed, ed Ordron's fine he's not really the big 
uh, X's and O's guy, more of a rah rah kind of, you know, get everybody uh, energized and and pumped up for the game. Yeah, great. But I mean, it's just more of a tactician. Tactician when you have guys like Gus Malzahn who basically created uh, the hurry up offense. You have guys like obviously Nick Saban, Kirby Smart, defensive more defensive guys. But also uh, are getting are more tactici- tacticians and uh, t- technicians as well uh, on the sidelines there when it comes to uh, managing a game. Uh, you see, I mean LSU. Yeah, you can in college. In college, you can use talent, you can use size and speed to get you some so many places. But when the competition is so high, like it is in the SEC, you have you really have to innovate. You have to innovate. And uh, you're not seeing that much at, in Baton Rouge with LSU. So uh, they do have Joe Burrow now, obviously. We'll see what happens when it comes to their quarterback decision. They, when you have a guy like that of that caliber who transfers over from Ohio State, uh, did, wasn't at spring practice, obviously, for LSU. But they had quarterbacks that's during, there during spring practice trying to battle for a job. So uh, does he just come right in there and uh, take over? Or does he have to actually really fight for a job with those two guys who already were fighting uh, fighting for it during the uh, spring practice uh, time. So that's that's the one thing that's remaining to be seen. But there are definitely, I mean, when you only have four guys out there who have won championships of, I mean, how many Division One schools are there? Division One A uh, FBS schools are there? It's probably 100, I think it's like 125, 145, and four of them have coaches that have a, a championship experience. So there's definitely guys out there who are high, more high profile. I said Jim Harbaugh already. Um, I don't really think that LSU expects to that much from from uh, from Ed Orgeron there. I think they're kind of in the. He's kind of still in the in the middle kind of thing when it comes to the coaching. I don't know. Do, do they really? Does LSU really see Ed Orgeron as their coach for like a long time? <laughs> and in the, in the in the in the foreseeable future, like continuing on. And obviously, they are sticking with him right now. But is it just kind of like a stopgap in between Les Miles and the next uh, the next big guy that they decide to bring in there? That's the one question right there for me. Uh, but as far as guys that need to prove something, I mean, I don't think Chris Peterson needs to prove anything. He's done a lot of stuff at uh, at Boise State, obviously now at Washington. Yeah, you might want to prove the fact that you can come over from a of a of a mid. I mean, I call I'll call Boise State kind of a mid major because they don't play in a Power Five conference, but they still have been very, 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 very successful. Uh, even in in uh, what are the in the probably the Mountain West or something like that. Right now, I think they I think they got them at a different conference, but uh, what Mountain West probably. Um, but you know, they get you gotta you gotta give him credit. Obviously, they have uh, Jake Browning. Hopefully, they all want to prove that they can get back to where they were. Jake Browning, when Jake was a sophomore, when they got a, in a game versus Alabama, obviously get buffed up against Alabama. That's uh, why I think they had a down year last year because Jake was kind of hurt. But uh, with Chris Peterson, obviously, look at that. You got another guy, innovative technician. Uh, kind of a really, really thinker on the sideline there and is going to get you through a game, especially when it comes to these offensive play calls in the most efficient way and uh, effective way possible. And when you have talent like that, obviously they do they do lose Dante Pettis on the outside. That's going to be a big deal. But, I mean, uh, they, they recruit pretty well up there. And uh, Washington has been a program that can be pretty – uh, desirable and can uh, attract kids. So uh, you got you got to appreciate that, and you got to know that. I mean, there's coaches out there who work hard, obviously, to bump, bump, boost, boost up their program and the uh, the the likeness of their program in order to get play- players. And because that's the college, that's what really the basis of college football is. Obviously, you could have these all these great coaches, talented motivators, and teachers and thinkers, all the, all alike. But uh, there's a reason why. Alabama is really good all the time. There's a reason why Clemson has been really good all the time because they have two of the best recruiters. Well, Clemson has been amazingly good. They probably well, was the last five, six, seven years. Uh, Clemson's got really good, but uh, that's because Dabo Swinney came over there and ha- is a really good recruiter, gets kids over to that school. Nick Saban, I've said it a million, a couple different times on this show. When he interviewed for that job, coming on back from the NFL, obviously had a bad little stint there with the Dolphins. Uh, but when he, uh, when you have a situation where he needs to be, he always he's going to be getting a job. He's not going to be the best coach, but it will probably be the uh, best recruiter. And that's what he said in his interviews. Like you're not going to be hiring the best coach. We're going to hire the best recruiter. I'm going to get the best kids in this school in this program and then we'll take it from there obviously when you get a guy with this floor because there's a whole thing with the floor and the ceiling with players uh you look at it with him thing with basketball players all all, all sorts of sports all with these with prospects and such like that they have uh these terms like floor and ceiling so floor if you have a, really, a player with a really high floor it means he comes in 
to a, a program with already a certain amount of skills uh, already under his belt, basically in his in his in his tool bag, toolbox, pretty much. He has the skills uh, already. He has a very high floor. Doesn't really need to be coached up, but his ceiling where he can get after that is uh is a different story so obviously that that's where the coaching comes into uh, effect where you can get that player from his floor to, to the ceiling but if they come in already with a really high floor it can be it can be more simple uh, to get them obviously to the to the uh, level they want you want them to be because they already come in so prepared and ready and talented obviously these guys i mean all these four or five star recruits i mean there's tons of them there's so many colleges uh, high schools all over the place that have these talented kids especially these days when Youth sports, it's just kind of it's kind of ridiculous. Obviously, we're getting to a point now where do we have our youth kid, young kids play football? I mean, it's a whole different conversation. Probably I can have it on a different show, uh, but I mean that it all, it all kind of goes into it goes into itself. Obviously, we're starting these kids off earlier. Uh, these coaches are getting them, and they're being able to watch them since they were since they're ju- freshmen, sophomores, juniors in high school. So some of these guys, uh, they might be bringing them back over, over. They might redeclare. <laughs> you got a kid down there. I mean, he's probably, I mean, the, the, you, you saw chosen Rosen. Do you think chosen Josh Rosen? That's why he got the nickname, by the way, uh, because he was supposed to be this chosen quarterback. JT Daniels left high school a year early <laughs> to go play. So, I mean, this, whether it's coaching, whether it's just these talents, high school coaching, all kind of things, college football is, uh, is that it's at its I don't think it's at its peak, but it's definitely uh, very visible, very uh, very popular. And the fact that we it's June twenty fifth right now, and we uh, are kind of right in the middle of baseball season. I mean, we're football season. Uh, I think the kickoff is probably I think we're seventy days away from the NFL kickoff, but which means we're probably about sixty uh, like sixty three days away from the college football, uh, college football kickoff for uh, week one because they obviously don't play. Uh, they play the week before, and, and there's no preseason in the in the, in the college football either. So uh, we're going to get real real games pretty soon here, and we're going to actually be able to go through those schedules, like I have been on this show a lot, and see actually those co- what those coaches are going to have to go through, those teams are going to have to go through uh, coming up this season because uh, it's going to be a fun one this year. You got Michigan, Notre Dame to start off, start off the season. You got Auburn and Washington to start off the season. I mean, talk about two coaches that need to prove something. Ch- uh, Brian Kelly going against uh, Jim Harbaugh, obviously, in that first game. And that's going to be a big test for both teams, I think. The fact that the, uh, the, if, the loser is really going to have to run the table if they want to get, especially Michigan. And Michigan does not lose. I remember I talked last, last, uh, last game, and we talked about my college football playoff predictions. And uh, I think that if Shea Patterson really hits home at Michigan, they could be a sneaky team. Where even even if they don't win a uh, don't win the Big Ten, say they, their one loss is to to Ohio State or something like that, and they can't make it to the Big Ten championship game, so they go in and they you have to make a decision. Basically, it's like okay, last year obviously we did not take the Pac-12 champion, nor did we take the big. Uh, oh, I mean the uh, Big Ten champion. I mean it was more of the the fact that they didn't take Ohio State into the tournament, I mean, into the thing last year because no, I mean USC had no business being in the college football playoff. They were not a top four team, but Ohio State definitely could have been an argument that they were. Um, no question about that. So this year, I'm thinking Michigan could be that team that they might want to actually sneak in there as the at-large bid where they don't win in their conference. Uh, it would probably be tough if Ohio State wins this conference. But um, it's still, uh, whether whether or not you have a loss or a win, obviously, on uh, in that first game against Notre Dame in the first, in the first week is going to... Uh, decide a lot of things i think it's going to decide i mean we've already seen jim harbaugh jim harbaugh should be the most comfortable person obviously yeah we think as a, as the media we think he has a lot to prove uh Ohio, michigan state or michigan sorry michigan university of michigan put a lot of uh, uh trust into him saying that i think the did the ad come out and said that he wants harbaugh in that job till he retires or something like that uh i don't know yeah it's gonna be kind of it's interesting uh how he how they're already just putting all their eggs in the jim harbaugh basket uh, trying to get him because I don't think they I don't think they want him to get lured back to the NFL. Uh, he obviously has success in the NFL. Um, he obviously is getting has probably a little bit more uh, accustomed to what he likes wh- here in the college game because he gets the that full um, full power because I mean he's basically the GM and the I mean the, yeah you have an athletic director but it's not really not like having a GM and an owner right on you. And obviously we saw what happened in San Francisco with the Niners and how he didn't really get along that much that well with the, uh, with the powers that be there 
with the Niners obviously having to move along. But, I mean, you get the same kind of money in college. If Michigan's willing to pay you that kind of money, you get the different kind of power. You get full roster control. Obviously, you're handpicking these players from uh, from high schools to come play for you. So I think that he does have a lot of proof this season because uh, you – you left the call. You left the NFL to go back to your college where you were successful with Stanford. Yeah. You got Andrew, Andrew Luck. That's great. Uh, but, uh, you need to go get back into college and actually prove that you can take over a roster. You can, uh, you can get players in, in healthy and actually in position to, to succeed. Uh, I know he hasn't really had much success when it comes to getting a quarterback, but that's comes down to recruiting. He's been there three years. You can't recruit a quarterback. Uh, fortunately, he did get that transfer. So uh, I think that Michigan will be fine. This year will be a fun one for Michigan. Notre Dame, the winner, uh, will definitely have a uh, nice little start off to their season when it comes to their uh, tra- hopes, hopes to make it to the college football playoff. I mean, yeah, both those teams are kind of the outside looking in, especially preseason. But uh, a win there would definitely help, especially uh, help there. If Notre Dame does well the rest of the season as well, if Michigan can beat them, and then basically that's kind of a strength, a strong win for them going into the uh, selection committee's decision. All right, that'll wrap it up for this segment. We'll come back and do our coaching ranks on the other side. So everybody, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy dash football dash podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, welcome back to GSMC Football Podcast on a mon- Monday today here as we are getting through through this offseason of college football. We're going to have uh, some training camps pretty soon here. Uh, I know that the NFL, we're going to have training camp as well soon here before their preseason games. But uh, getting to what I wanted to talk about in this segment um, is the coaching rankings that I just cr- uh, have created, matriculated over the last uh, few weeks of when I went through the coaches, you know, looking at records and I don't, I mean, you might, there's one person who you might not think, okay, why isn't he on here? Because, I mean, current coaches, I didn't put him on there because of uh, the fact that he's only been a coach for one year. <laughs> I mean, he's only been a coach for, uh, for a head coach for one year. I know there's other, there's another guy on there who's only been a coach for one year, too. But uh, he did something, he's special. So we'll, we'll go over that in a little bit here as we go down our list of, uh, I did a top 10. So no top 15. And it was only, it's hard to narrow it down to 10. Obviously, we, we have a pretty, uh, good idea but this is for this is tom's top 10 when it comes to uh head coaches in the college world world so actually we're going to start at number 10 and i actually put jim harbaugh at number 10 because i think there's nine better coaches than him lincoln riley might be better than him that's actually i'll let you guys know that's the one guy i did not put on this list lincoln riley's not on this list because he when he gets in the coach if he can coach a few more times maybe see what he can do with uh Kyler murray see what he does without Kyler murray uh see what he does without baker mayfield so we'll uh We'll, we'll, we'll do that, but uh, we'll say that. But according, uh, I mean, just according to my list, Jim Harbaugh, number 10, because I love Jim Harbaugh. I love what he did at Stanford, obviously, uh, with Andrew Luck. You don't win the Orange Bowl, though, just saying. Uh, or is it the Fiesta Bowl, I think, when they lost to – yeah, Fiesta Bowl, when they lost to uh, – they did win the Orange Bowl. They lost the Fiesta Bowl to Oklahoma State with Brandon Whedon because their kicker couldn't make a field goal. But, uh, yeah, that was not a fun game for me to watch. But – uh no, Jim Harbaugh hasn't really done much at Michigan, hasn't beat Ohio State one time, uh, hasn't really gotten that big recruit in there yet when it comes to a uh, skill position, whether it's running back or, or, or quarterback or even a big defensive player. I, know that, I mean, he had Jabril, Jabril Peppers, but I think he was there already, actually, when he got in there, so I uh, can't really give them the credit there. But, um, 
you got to beat Mich- you got to beat you got to beat Ohio State. You just have to. You got to beat Ohio State. You got to beat Michigan State. And uh, he hasn't beaten Ohio State yet. I don't think I think he's only beaten Michigan State once. So I mean, there's uh, lots of different things going. Obviously, we've had some fluky things happen with those that Michigan State Michigan game. Uh, but with Jim Harbaugh. Uh, the guy obviously likes to do a lot of different things, kind of outside of the box thinker. Uh, definitely likes to be in charge. We saw Pat has problems a little bit with authority uh, and uh, people above him, so he likes to have full full say on the roster and everything like that. So he's there doing that in Michigan. But uh, whether it's the trips to the Vatican, or I think they're going to Africa this year or next year, or something like that. So uh, that, that I mean, that's pretty cool. But we'll keep it on the football field here. He hasn't really done. He hasn't really shown me that much. Oh, I'm having him at number 10, honestly, because he uh, maybe name recognition, maybe because of what he did at Stanford. Yeah, that's probably what got him to number 10. If anything, he'd probably be below that as uh, I was easily actually I was having trouble fading him in this list because I get to, I get down. I go one through nine. I'm like, wait, where's Harbaugh? We got to stick him at 10. because I really couldn't think of anybody else and maybe underneath him, but or uh, to go I mean, for him to go instead of him. So at 10 so harbaugh's 10 uh that's 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 that okay deal with it and at number nine we're gonna actually put jimbo fisher not really a big fan of what he did at florida state uh uh not really a fan at all obviously the whole turnover from bobby bowden to jimbo was kind of a weird uh storyline in the in the, in the media uh, how they handled it there obviously he's had some issues when he where when deandre francois starts getting it, it, whether he got hurt obviously got hurt but then has some issues with um has some issues with uh, the law enforcement and some issues with his just personal life in general. I'm not telling, not saying that's why J- that's why Jimbo just got out of there, but he did jump ship when he had a chance. He's Kevin Sumlin, obviously leave Texas A&M. Okay, I'm going to go over there. But what, really, what makes Texas A&M a better program than Florida State? I don't know. Florida State, you play in the you play in the ACC. You your best, your biggest rival, your your biggest competition to win the ACC is probably Clemson or Miami. That's it. In the SEC, yeah, maybe it's a bigger challenge over there. You get to you get to recruit Texas uh, a little bit more, but Florida has a lot of talent, just as probably as much as Texas does. Uh, but yeah, I just I, he's number nine. He did great. Obviously, had a great roster at Florida State when they won that when they won that uh, national championship. Gets Jim, you have a NFL caliber quarterback in Jameis Winston. Uh, you have an NFL NFL receiver. Kelvin Benjamin wins the game for you. Uh, I mean, they could have easily lost that game, honestly, but uh, they they didn't. They won. So you got to give him credit. Got to give the guy credit. He's one of the one of the four guys we talked about at the beginning of the show that has a, a national title on his resume. So. And they're all on this list, obviously, uh, those four guys. Uh, but he's number he's one of them. So he's at number nine. Just because, I mean, he, you don't get as much X's and O's from him. I mean, the guy went up and tra- started screaming at a, uh, at a uh, spectator at one of the Florida State games last year after a game. I mean, it's not he's not the most, uh, sometimes isn't the most politically correct guy. He's not the easiest uh, public- publicity guy and uh, has trouble. Uh, sometimes with the media as well. So as fans, so you have to kind of get taken for what it is uh, uh, for with Jimbo. He's had the success, so he got he gets on the list because of his success. Uh, number eight is uh, Chris Peterson at was at Washington. Uh, he honestly could be a little bit higher on this list, I think, but um, doesn't really have the championship pedigree yet. Um, for uh, for me to get him up the list a little bit higher, but J- Chris Peterson, great cerebral coach, great player development guy, uh, took a took takes great recruiter. Honestly, getting guys over to Boise State to have the talent to be able to compete. And um, this is a guy who's won a, he's won a Fiesta Bowl himself with a Statue of Liberty play we saw against Oklahoma all those years ago. Um, and so he's not only is he smart and inv- innovative and everything, but he's also gutsy and he lets his players go out there and uh, have some fun and uh, make plays for themselves in order to get them to the next level. So that's what that's why I like Chris. I love Chris Peterson. Also great with the player, great with players, great with uh, y- young players when it comes to recruiting and stuff like that. So um, great X's and O's guys as well as uh, he's really been able to get. I mean, the fact you get West Washington. When was the last time Washington really was a got into a college football playoff or even sniffing a top ranking uh you know he gets over there and he gets him in the top five top ten uh, he's been i think they've been every season so he definitely deserves his, his position in this list uh but he yeah right now he's at number what i say number eight as uh 
Number seven is Mark Richt. At uh, he's now in Miami, obviously. Now, what previous was at Georgia. Did great, obviously great Georgia. I mean, this is Georgia every year. Yeah, you have your Alabamas, you have your Auburns and stuff like that. But Auburn's had up and down years. For, uh, LSU's had up and down years. Pretty much the only team, only program that really hasn't had a, a that much volatility, uh, especially while he was there, was was Georgia. Georgia and and Alabama really were the two stalwarts in that two, in that uh, in that conference. So you had. The stability on either side, on either side, and they play each other a lot in the college football. I mean, in the uh, SEC championship game as well. So uh, you got to give him credit. Got to give him the credit to get over to Miami and be able to get that program back into the forefront, back into the conversation like they were last year with uh, uh, Link Rozier as the quarterback, getting him towards uh, a chance. I mean, obviously, they fall off a little bit at the end of the season, ran the gas, but I mean, that's not really on the coach. That's kind of on more of the players. I would say probably just, you know, spreading it out the season, knowing it's a long season, be able to keep yourself, uh, keep yourself, uh, ready for the, the last three games of the season, obviously more important, most important games, but you lose that one to Pittsburgh. I think that's what it's all started. Uh, they lose to Pittsburgh that kind of a trap game at 10 AM in the morning. It kind of just put a damper, damper on their whole season. They were really wanted that undefeated record. So, uh, they would have really no, I mean, if they're undefeated, you really have any chance, especially if they beat Clemson in the ACC championship game, uh, you have no chance to put them in and no, quite no choice, but to put them in the, uh, cultural playoff. Obviously they lose to that, that game to Pittsburgh and they think, Oh crap, we're, we're kind of toasted even, uh, at, before this game, if they go and beat Clemson now, and uh, they're probably down their luck a little bit there. But I do like Mark Rick. I do like the uh, X's. He's a kind of a, more of a raw, raw, not as much cerebral guy as you get from some of those other coaches with the X's he knows. But a uh, great recruiter, gets good players in there, gets great talent on, on the field, and uh, is a winner as well. So you got to love that. I love Mark Rick out there as well. Also, great interview. If you ever watch a Mark Rick interview? He gives a great interview, great answers as well. Uh, treats the media very nicely. Uh, next, actually, kind of high on this list. I was kind of surprised how, how high I ended up putting him on this list, but it's Kirby Smart. I love Kirby Smart. You got a freshman quarterback, your first year in a program. Uh, obviously, yeah, he's under. He's under Nick Saban, but this is a defensive guy. And Georgia, if anything, they were they were very innovative on offense last year, whether it was with the two running backs they had, Nick Chubb and uh, Sonny Michelle, being able to play them off of each other uh, was great. Then you have the uh, quarterback, obviously, the young quarterback in Jake Fromm, and be able to get him in a position to succeed in his freshman year. Uh, but it just was, gets him in this f- five, fifth spot. That's why I love him, because he uh, you, got it, you have a young quarterback. He's able to pop him up and get the good coaches around you to be able to get him in a good position, especially for a guy who is not uh, an offensive guy, really. He's a... Uh, He's more of a defensive guy. He was a defensive coordinator with uh, with Nick Saban over at Alabama. So he changed that, take those talents and get him over at Georgia. And obviously, you see what happens. You get him in a college football playoff final, a national championship game uh, against his former um, against his former team as well. So you got to give the guy credit. He was one within one play of beating that former team with a rookie with a freshman quarterback as well. So you got to give Kirby Smart all the uh, all the credit that he deserves. Uh, next is um, did I actually make this a I think I made this an 11, 11 person list. Actually, I think I can't, I can't count very, no, I can count. Next is Dabo Sweeney. He's, uh, I don't know. Next actually, no, next is Gus Malzahn. Number five. Yeah. Smart was sixth. Six, five is, uh, Gus Malzahn. This guy who created the fast offense, uh, created a created a system where he can get the uh, defense on their on their on their heels basically, and be just continuing to push it on their throats and being able to get to a team uh, like like Auburn and basically make make that game make the Iron Bowl fun again. Because I mean, seemingly obviously Auburn got there they had, when they had Cam Newton, it was great, but. Um, yeah, you have Cam Newton. That's great when you win a championship and or get close to it. Yeah, you win a national championship, but that obviously was not. Uh, that was that was not Gus Malzahn, right? Uh, that was. Do uh, you have you get you get somebody though there when you're the little brother to Alabama? You got to give him credit. He's always competitive. Always makes the Iron Bowl a fun game. Uh, great, great, great cerebral guy. Obviously, with the X's and O's, he's uh, all, has got everything, all the tools and everything that you need uh, in order to uh, create a team that's going to be successful and competitive against a uh, obviously always, always competitive and challenging Alabama squad. So, Gus Malzahn is number five on this list. Next is Dabo Swinney at number uh, number four. We'll do the top three on the next segment, but Dabo Swinney. I mean, yeah, yeah, you gotta. You get a guy like, you get a guy like, uh, what was it, like Deshaun Watson on your team. 
that that gives you a list already because you obviously know how good Deshaun Watson is. But not only has he created a culture there of winning in Clemson, you get good players in there. You create an offense that has a, has a uh, ability of to win a national championship game against the best team in the league, in probably college football history in the recent history, Alabama for Crimson Tide. But also, he's also instilled a defensive culture there. They're really more of a defensive team, uh, Clemson, and they're known for their defense. They have guys like Christian Wilkins who don't want to leave. Uh, they want to be able to develop the younger guys and play together and win a lot of football games. And when you have good defense, when you have great line plays, especially on the defensive line, you can disrupt a lot of things. That's what Dabble Sweeney's done there. He's also great. Uh, great with the media, great interviewer, great uh, with the coach, a great recruiter as well. As uh, he's definitely a guy that uh, loves football, fun to be around, I'm sure, and uh, deserves to be on this list. Obviously, is a guy who's won a championship, knows uh, what it takes, and what it takes to cultivate a uh, talented defense, not only a talented offense as well. Sometimes we get kind of lost on all these flashy, big gainer offensive plays. I mean, forget that defense wins championships a lot of the time. So uh, then you you can uh, take that. And uh, have Dabo on your list there at number four. All right, we'll come back with the uh, top three in the next segment. Then we're going to do a little talk on the red shirt rule and then go through um, some exciting players for each top 25 team as well looking for this season as uh, we get ready for a big season of college football. A lot of, a lot of good stuff to get to. So we'll stay tuned. We'll be right back. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to GSMC Football Podcast on a Monday today, the college football edition of this podcast as we're going through our top 10 coaches, according to yours truly, uh, Tom Doherty, your host here on a Monday, uh, the college football coaches, the top 10 created by yours truly me as I have gotten to the top three guys that I have put down the uh, top 10. Uh, it came out as Harbaugh is number 10, so, so four through 10 will go uh, Swinney. Gus Malzahn, Kirby Smart, Mark Richt, Chris Peterson, Jimbo Fisher, and then uh, Jim Harbaugh. So we'll have three more to go. And number three might surprise you, but uh, it's David Shaw. David Shaw for me. Uh, you have created and cultivated, obviously, he, a, a culture there at Stanford through Jim Harbaugh's expertise and everything there. But J David Shaw has been a guy who's been just thwarting off, of, thwarting off uh, call, the calling to the NFL uh, and he's been saying, no, 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 I like being at Stanford. I like being in control. I like being in and, and my nice little house in Palo Alto. I also like having my assistant coaches have their uh, houses housing paid for or at least be uh, paid enough to be able to live in this area. So we have a good culture here. We I, I got a good thing going here at Stanford. I don't want to lose it. And uh, he does have a good thing going at Stanford. He's been able to continue the success that Jim Harbaugh started when he came into that program from San Diego. Uh, he's been able to t get prospects like Ch Christian McCaffrey ready for the NFL. And I mean, look what, ha look what he had last year as a, as a rookie. That's, that's David Shaw. That's the uh, coaching at Stanford, getting that guy ready for a big rookie season there. I mean, obviously don't, can't take anything from the Carolina Panthers coaching staff. They had him for uh, the training camp, obviously before the season, but the upbringing, the whole college experience at Stanford is great. And uh, he's created a culture in that program where it's winning. It's a winning culture of that program, whether uh, you are going to have a lot of injuries or such like that, which obviously they had to deal with last year. Uh, tr trouble at quarterback. I mean, really, you had Kevin Hogan after Andrew Luck left, and then you've been kind of a question mark. Uh, you had 
I mean, KJ Costello is there now. Uh, you had Keller Chris before that. He's been he's transferred out. Um, so you have to kind of figure it out when it comes to. And wasn't it Burns or uh, I think they had Ryan Burns there before that. Um, th- so now it's KJ Costello. It's Bryce Love. It's um, a, a offensive line. It's a defense. I mean, the Stanford defense. You got to. That's where David Shaw I think doesn't really get his due due, due credit. Is the defense on Stanford has always been a tough one. They've had a, they've always had great secondaries. They've gotten guys drafted a bunch from the secondary positions, whether it's safety or cornerback. Um, they, I mean, line play, line play, everything. Solomon Thomas, Trent, uh, Trent Murphy. I mean, they've had guys like Blake Martinez come out of that conference. I mean, come out of that program as well. So, I mean, Stanford for, for and this is a program where it's rigorous. It, it is a schedule every single day that you have to deal with. Every uh, at uh, at the height of your college abilities you're sitting in class you're you you fought to get to this position obviously these guys have been working hard in the classroom and on the field uh all ever i mean all throughout high school as well to get to this position where stanford doesn't just recruit certain areas they recruit everywhere because they need to get prospects need to get kids that are yeah uh, very highly highly rated football players but also are highly uh accustomed highly uh I'm almost trying to say here, their mental acuity is quite high. I mean, it's just a state ability of mental capacity uh, to be able to go through. I mean, you listen to Rick, Richard Sherman. He talked about the, when he, after he came out, uh, I think it was like his sophomore, his uh, second year in the NFL, he came out and said, or during the, when they made the Super Bowl, the Seahawks did, the Stanford schedule is ridiculous. You have like 6 a.m. waits, then you have class, then you have practice then you have to go to your study hall and then you get home from study hall and do more homework oh and then you have i think a film session or something like that in between there and you have to eat some time in between all that so i mean and the class isn't just like a class it's like five three classes and it's only six hours six hours of class and then another three or four or five hours of practice so i mean and that's, that adds up. That's twelve hours. I mean, that's ten hours right there. What are you going to do? Uh, eat not. I mean, yeah, they have they have a rigorous schedule there. I mean, it's a rigorous schedule. It's a rigorous uh, expectations when it comes to the, you keeping your grades up, making sure that you're graduating. I mean, look at Bryce Love. Bryce Love's a biology major, human biology major. The guy wants to be a doctor. I mean, this is crazy. And he's also the best running back in the league. So uh, Stanford, it, the coaching, David Shaw, everything they're able to do there, whether it's reco- recruiting, coaching, all in one. This guy is a uh, high class, high, high class. I hope the Stanford can be good. I mean, if they get a big, obviously with Bryce Love, they have the big prospect that they can get their their schedule the way they want it. Don't have any surprise losses to SDSU this year. And uh, they can be in a, chan- in a position where they could be fighting for a college football playoff position if they can get maybe in a uh, undefeated scenario where they win a, co- a, pack cha- a packed whole championship and uh, maybe force those college football committee uh, m- folks to uh, f- to get them in uh, through a undefeated season or maybe even a one loss season with the uh, call with a pack 12 title. Um, I mean, you'd have wins against Washington, probably uh, obviously USC, Notre Dame, as well, so uh, they could uh, have a nice little resume at the end of the year, and of course, David Shaw will have them ready to do that. And I love, love, love David Shaw. Uh, number two, moving along after I my gush over David Shaw enough, is uh, Urban Meyer. Uh, and basically, for me, honestly, this is one B to Nick Saban being one A. We know Nick Saban's the only one left for number one, but Urban Meyer and him have been the uh, just exemplary, just beacons of excellence in this college football world. Um, whether it's, I mean, you obviously have had big coaches. We had top top coaches, but they've all, a lot of them have gone down through uh, whether it's scandal or uh, issue. I mean, when, even when Pete Carroll was the, the height of its his power at USC, they had issues with the stuff that Reggie Bush was dealing with. Dealing with whether it was a specific player. I know Jim Trestle had the same kind of issue with Terrell Pryor down there. I mean, we haven't. What, what was the last time we had an issue with Urban Meyer? When was that time we had an issue really with a, compl- uh, a rules issue with uh, with Nick Saban. I mean, I probably could be forgetting some stuff. Like, no, but nobody's uh, uh, completely clean because there's so many darn rules. And the NCAA is ridiculous. But Urban Meyer to be able to do what he's doing at two different programs. Uh, you have a guy like Tim Tebow, one of the best college football players ever to uh, strap it on and get on the field. Now you get to Ohio State. You win. A, you win a national championship game with a freshman quarterback. Or was he? It was. Uh, 
was he a freshman quarterback or he was a sophomore or something like that? Well, he had to deal with injuries, obviously. He comes in their third quarterback, uh, Cardell Jones. So uh, you have to be able to do that, be able to have a guy uh, like Ezekiel Elliott get the recruits over there to be able to cultivate talent at, uh, at Ohio State, which has been – I mean, he came in there and he was like, oh, I'm done with coaching. I don't really want to do any more. Oh, Ohio State, there that, 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 that a job's open? Okay, good. I'll take that. Yeah, opportunity guy too. So, I mean, I uh, did not cower at the uh, opportunity to go uh, be the next football coach uh, in Columbus. So, took that opportunity, ran with it. Now he's got, another self, got himself another title under his belt, got himself – uh, definitely pushed up in the uh, ranks of college football lore. Uh, I think what's is that three for him? Because he had two at Florida, one at uh, Ohio State. I mean, this is a guy who has been kind of. He started at Utah, I think, too. He's also had success at Utah, small school. I mean, not not a small school, but definitely not a big football power. Ohio State being a football power along with uh with Florida. But um with a uh, Utah too, I mean, the guy had Alex Smith, got Alex Smith become a first round pick, a first uh pick overall. So I mean the guy knows how to work with the offenses. He never uh he's also doesn't forget about forget about the defense. I mean Ohio State's had top top recruits, top draft picks and defense too. Joy Bosa, Joy Bosa's brother. Um, you got uh, obviously Denzel Ward ob- uh, out there as well. So the guy cultivates uh, top talent, and uh, he knows how to do it. He knows how to win as well too. So I mean, uh, look at that. He comes in to Ohio State. So does Jim uh, Jim Harbaugh goes into Michigan, and what's he three and zero against Michigan? So uh, Urban Meyer knows how to win the close game. Knows how to win the blowout game. Knows how to win a game when he has to deal with a lot of injuries too. So he's kind of been dealt how to deal with everything. JT Barrett was not healthy all of last year. Fortunately, he's got uh, a a guy this year to come in and take over that quarterback job pretty easily. Nice little handoff, but um, it's also had to do with some things when it comes to the quarterbacks who wanted to be quarterback and can't play, whether it's a Joe Burrow transferring uh, or you're going to have to deal with Tate, Tate Martell, get, whether they're going to split playing time with uh, Tate Martell and uh, what's the – is it Dwayne, Dwayne, ha- Dwayne Haskins or something like that for – uh, for their quarterback, the new guy at Ohio State, I probably said his name a million times, can never remember his name, but uh, the new quarterback there at Ohio State. But yeah, get, great coach. I mean, X's and O's guy, whether it's everything in front of the media, handles everything uh, to the highest power. Might, might be a little snooty sometimes, you think, uh, but that's just coaches being coaches. And uh, last but not least, obviously, is Nick Saban, uh, the guy who... I usually I didn't like Nick Saban. I wasn't a big fan of Nick Saban, but then he I watched a lot more. I paid attention to him a lot more, seeing him go through the tribes and tribulations of that college football playoff last season. Uh, obviously, is a great pre- uh, preparer, a guy who prepares his players for pretty much everything. I mean, look at look what happened last year. Tell me that the, the, if you're a coach or if you know a coach or if they if if your coach or your college football team could do this. You have a rookie quarter, a freshman. I say rookie every time because I'm talking about it's the, not the pros. It's freshman quarterback. You have a freshman quarterback who actually came out and said after the fact that if he didn't play against Georgia, I mean the guy was already pretty confident. So I mean you got to give Tua some credit too. Tua, Tua Tagovailoa, the guy wanted to play. He said he was going to transfer if he didn't play in that game. So he plays in the game. Nick Saban makes one of the biggest decisions you possibly could make, uh, and that's to take out his guy, his starter, he's had his all year, uh, and realize that J- Jalen Hurts does not have it against Georgia. He's not doing much against Georgia defense and throws in the rookie, the freshman quarterback did it again, freshman quarterback. And, uh, he just takes off, gets you back into the game. Oh, and then not only did you make that decision, but you also have the ability to prepare him for adversity. So when he gets sacked on the second to last play of the game in overtime and, and um, honestly, I thought lost the game for them. They had no chance. They were, what was it? They were, Fourth and third and goal, fourth and goal from the it was the last play. It was like fourth and goal from the what thirty yard line or something. Obviously, can get get his players in position to be ready for a situation like that. Be ready for a situation where you have to make a play. You have to. Obviously, it's great that the, the they had blown covers on that left side, but you, he saw the blown coverage. He saw the mistake in the defense. He saw the corner that thought that he saw the corner thought he had uh, safety help and he didn't have safety help. Safety didn't get there in time. Ball's there. So you have a freshman quarterback, and he has the ability to put the ball on its spot uh, where it needs to be in crunch time, especially after he just took a bad, bad, bad sack. Bad, it was a bad sack. I mean, guys, come on. Uh, and that's all preparation. That's coaching, a lot of coaching, a lot of preparation. Obviously, I think Tua is uh, a very good athlete himself and a very good quarterback and is a smart kid himself, so he knows the situation as well. But uh, it's also you can hand it to recruiting too then. You could say recruiting. The guy recruited a guy who – 
the, the coach recruited a guy who was going to be ready for, situ- for a situation like that. Obviously, you can't. Okay, to uh, we're we're thinking about recruiting you and and giving you a scholarship at the University of Alabama. What would you do if you just were sacked for a twelve yard loss and had fourth and goal from the thirty yard line for a national championship? Would you be ready for that? It's like really, you can't do that. It's like there's impo- it's impo- almost impossible to uh, to get to a situation like that where I mean. You're going to have a coach uh, get a player ready like that, but he is able to do it. Uh, I don't think he did it. Obviously, sitting in Hawaii, get to getting a kid come over from his—I uh, mean, what was he? Probably six thousand miles away from home at Alabama or in Georgia for that game uh, to get that done and to uh, to be able to do it at such a, such a young age and such a uh, young time, uh, short time at that school gives pedigree to your coach obviously for getting you ready but then also gives you pedigree for, for being the uh, athlete to, to be able to have the skills to do it but nick saban obviously is the is the goat when it comes to uh college football coaches and he's already uh, he's, he's at he, and he's funny because he's at the program he's not doing it at some random program he's doing it at the university of alabama where they had the best coach in college football for years and probably historically you probably could still say the best coach in college football in uh, bear bryant so uh, you got to give nick saban his credit all right, come back in the uh, last segment. We'll go. I mean, I, t- I talked about the redshirt rule a little bit in the last show. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more too, and in and the, in the final segment, then we'll go over some exciting players for this coming season for uh, a few of our favorite teams in the top uh, top top twenty five right now. So we'll do that when we come back. Stay tuned. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back, GSMC Football Podcast on a Monday, the College Football Edition with your host Tom Doherty. As uh, we're going to get in and do some talk on the, the redshirt rule, which we talked about a little bit last week when they uh, announced it. Actually, it was kind of a breaking news uh, thing for me when they announced it. I was able to uh, get that uh, on the air for the last segment, but I do want to go over a little bit more with the uh, what the rules are. And whether it's a positive or negative uh, kind of thing, obviously, I think I think it's a good thing. I think coaches think it's a good thing. I think coaches are really going to plan for it ahead of time. Uh, they're going to pick players out. They're probably going to. I mean, it's going to be kind of getting players more out there. I mean, it's going to get players' ability to uh, at least have kind of a little show me tryout uh, before uh, they have to go take off the red shirt basically the next season and uh, and give it like that. But so, I mean, obviously, it's going to affect some things. I think. Uh, with transfers uh, is going to affect uh, how scholarships get handed out. I think it's going to affect a lot of different things more than just playing time, uh, but also will probably allow kids to be like, okay, do I go to this school and get redshirted or do I, or do I go to this school and not get redshirted? Even though I know if I go to this school and get redshirted, I can still play four games and then still have four, year, four years of eligibility. I can go show out for a game or two. You can even have a guy... I don't know. I don't know if they've actually exposed this rule, uh, or, or actually come to this point. But can't you? You have. You can have a red shirt be lifted, basic by a team. Obviously, it will affect if you do get a red shirt lifted. So, say you play your red shirt guy a game earlier in the season, and he really shows out, and you want him every week now. Okay, take off the red shirt. Yeah, he loses that year in the back end, but he still has three years, and he show showed that he's ready to play now. So, uh, there's probably lots of different. Re- there's lots of different reasons. I think that. Uh, that you can have this and uh it it's just a great it's a great rule it's a great addition to the uh to the uh to, to these rules and it's a great change with the call to the college football game i think it's going to be coming out as a uh, big deal uh with these uh with these all these players looking trying to get on the field and show out what show that they so they can do prove off to their school why they uh 
put so much uh, trust into them and came and recruited them. And then obviously when a player signs, it's also putting trust back into the school that that player thinks that they can um, do a lot for them when it comes to getting ready for their future. Cause it's just a stepping stone. College is just a stepping stone, whether it's obviously the, the very, very lucky guys who are able to play in the NFL or are getting a good education, hopefully get a good, get a good education in order to uh, go out and get a, get uh, start their lives in the real world. Uh, all right. Going in uh, with this last 10 minutes of this of the show today, I do want to talk about the uh, some players to watch for. Obviously, there's some obvious guys uh, as we'll go through the top 25 here. Um, I'll start with Alabama and Tua Tagovailoa and uh, the fact that we, have, we don't know if he's even going to be the starter this season yet. Uh, we hope so. I hope so. I think so. I don't know so because we haven't heard anything from the, uh, from uh, Nick Saban. We haven't heard anything from uh, University of Alabama whatsoever. So uh, I think that's going to be something that gets decided as we get closer to this, closer and closer to the uh, season start. Obviously, we don't know uh, if he's going to start, but hopefully if he does, uh, we will uh, – Hopefully, when he does, we're going to be there, obviously, to watch him. Because he's a pretty, pretty sh- transcendent player. We see what he could do uh, in even just a short uh, stint there with the uh, with the game against Georgia last year or this year. In uh, it was just this year in January. Uh, Clemson. I talked about Christian Wilkins. I talked about with when I talked when I was talking about Double Swinney, Swinney and how he's able to create a culture there at Clemson, a defensive culture. I think they're going to be a team that's going to be good for a, for a very long time because of this defensive culture and also the fact that you can recruit a top five, a, a five star recruit to come and play a quarterback for you. That's Trevor Lawrence eventually. Uh, we still have Kelly Kelly Bryant there, but uh, Christian Wilkins is really going to be the linchpin of this defense, and he's going to have a bunch of young guys around him who are very good in their own rights. But this is a guy who could have gone to the draft this year and been a high draft pick uh, in, in the NFL, and he'll likely be one again, uh, be one next next season when he uh, does declare, but. This is a guy you have to go to the defensive line of this Clemson team. It's the heart and soul of this team. It's why they get they're in position to win a lot of the times so because they just can keep points off the board. And that's a key in college football. You, and same thing with the uh, line play. Like I said, just to go watch a game and watch the line. Watch the offensive line. Don't watch any of the skilled players. Don't watch the ball around it. Nine times out of ten, whoever had the more better push, better leverage, better line play is going to win that game. And uh, when you have a defense like defense like that, and more quick, uh, led by Christian Wilkins on the defensive line for Clemson, they're going to be wrecking a lot of offensive lines, and they're going to be partying in a lot of backfields this season, <laughs> to use that cool little term. Uh, number three. Uh, is going to be Ohio State. Yeah, right now, Ohio State, J.K. Dobbins is their running back. Uh, we picked this over the... Uh Pick this over the the quarterback. Obviously, I could throw the quarterback out there too. Uh, with what obviously Tate Martell isn't quite in the conversation right now. It's the other uh, that they figure out obviously what they're going to do there. But J.K. Dobbins does not have a competition right now. He's gonna, he's going to be on the field. He's going to be that guy for uh, to be. Uh, then we'll see if it's the next uh, the next Carlos Hyde or is it going to be the next Ezekiel Elliott? Because those are two different guys. Have had two different careers in the NFL already. Um, but from Ohio State, but they definitely know how to uh, develop a running back. Another running back, DeAndre Swift. We talked about him a lot at Georgia, obviously, uh, coming in and being the guy who was the third running back behind Chubb and Tony Michelle, and even put out some good yardage last season and uh, showed off that he has uh, a very, very fast uh, acceleration and very, very fast uh, off the ball, so off the line scrimmage. So you can... Um, thought the think that Georgia is this machine of uh, of talent it is and uh, it's because they are able to uh, show off their 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 freshmen early because they can get him behind guys like Nick Chubb and Sean Michelle and have him be that kind of uh, change of pace back where he's just going to run right under your throat with his speed uh, and now he's going to be the number one guy uh, as a, I think he's going to be a sophomore only as a soft, but just a sophomore coming in now, and he'll likely be uh, on uh, your highlight shows a lot this coming season. Uh, another running back, Miles Gaskins at Washington. A couple running backs actually we want to talk about: Jonathan Taylor, Miles Gaskins, and DeAndre Swift. Also, uh, are going to fight with Bryce Love to uh, be that the top running back in the league this year. We're going to have a lot of this. Be another great running back draft next season. I don't think DeAndre Swift declares yet, but we're going to have uh, we're, you'll, you'll have Bryce Love coming out. You'll have uh, Miles Gaskins likely coming out. Jonathan Taylor probably the same thing, um, but. Uh, 
yeah, we have a lot of talent in the running game. Uh, not our, our, we're in good hands when it comes to the uh, for future of running backs in in our call in football. But um, we do for, we don't want to forget about oh, Kyler Murray in Oklahoma. Obviously, Oklahoma sitting at number five right now. Kyler Murray obviously signed that huge four point seven million dollar contract with the A's. Uh, after they drafted him ninth overall in the Major League Baseball draft, as uh, now he's going to have to come back to Norman, uh, where he's been able to be, he's been granted a year of play time by the A's. Uh, and uh, with Coach uh, Coach Riley, we talked about that. With, like, does Lincoln Riley kind of like put pump the brakes a little bit? Does he let him go roam free? Uh, how do you how do you manage a guy who's got a four point seven million dollar price tag on his head? And um, while while you're also trying to win football games, so uh, for your for your for your program, so it's kind of a, it's gonna be kind of tough. To, I think it's gonna be a tough situation for Lincoln Riley, honestly. Uh, jumping down now to number eight, uh, Miami. Their defense was the big deal last year. Obviously, you have Malik Rozier as a quarterback, but their defense uh, this year is gonna be led by uh, Jaquan Johnson, the safety. Obviously, they have a guy. This is a guy who wore the tur- turnover chain a lot last season. Uh, whether it was forcing fumbles or getting interceptions or what have you, uh, this is a guy who's going to disrupt a lot of offensive, uh, a lot of offenses, and it's going to be a guy in the back in the in, in the defensive backfield to uh, make a difference. Also, uh, keep the, keep the def- keep the offenses honest on those deep balls as well, as uh, he's that hard hitting safety. Also can, co- also can come down well in run support, um, as we like to have our safeties do. Uh, to round out the top 10, Michigan State and Michigan. Uh, Felton Davis and Michigan State is a wide receiver, and he's going to be a guy on the outside. I mean, this is, uh, I mean, he's six foot four, 200, foot, 200 pounds. I mean, what about, talk about a target. I mean, you saw what they, what uh, Florida State did when they had Clevin Benjamin a few years ago. Uh, you see what a big, top, tall receiver can do uh, with against a probably an undersized secondary, or not undersized, the normal size is probably like six foot, and uh, you can still do some damage and kind of create a uh, create some sort of separation or some a big target for your quarterback to get the ball to uh, at Michigan their defense has been their bread and butter has been keeping them relevant for a long time uh, they have a linebacker uh, Kaleki Hudson uh, who is going to be kind of in that you know that viper position for uh, Michigan they have right there that kind of roaming a smaller run- linebacker uh, in the middle of the field and uh, Hudson I mean this is a guy who made 18 tackles for loss last season I mean he's all in the backfield has um, a couple different prospects in front of him when it comes to uh, NFL talent but he can be a guy who can definitely pop onto the stage uh, very soon here so we got to give him a, a, a good look for sure um, in this one all right, I don't want to really go further. I just wanted to do top ten. Obviously, Bryce Love's on there for Stan- for Stanford. Trace McSorley, um, as we look through all these guys who could are going to have big deals. Uh, Josh Jackson at uh, Washington, uh, Virginia Tech as well. So um, we'll go. We'll stick with the top ten here on the show as uh, we do come to the end of the episode today. Uh, the GSMC Cultural college football uh, podcast or gsmc football podcast this is the college football edition of that show eventually we'll have a uh, our own standalone uh, podcast for you guys to go check out um but right now that red shirt rule is a uh, kind of a new thing is going to i think it's going to transcend college football uh whether it's for the better or for the worse it's yet to see i think it's going to be more for the better because uh, it's going to be able to get guys out there and uh, still hold their eligibility uh, be able to keep them keep them loose and keep them playing it's going to be i think it's gonna be a big deal in recruiting as well because uh like i said you're gonna have guys who never have offers on the table for uh for from schools and like okay am i gonna play at this school or am i have to redshirt for a year i want to play this first season i want to take a year off and um, if you have that now, you have the, with, now with this rule, you can obviously uh, create a situation where a guy will still is still is going to be willing now to go to that program, play for them, and then take the red shirt, but then also be able to have those four games uh, to get to uh, get to get in, on the field and be able to get that playing time as well. So that's always nice. We also went over my coaching uh, my coaching ranks, uh, my top ten and coaches in the college football right now. Um, if I can remember off the top of my head. I think Ken, I was like from ten, from one to ten. From one to ten, I was like Saban, Meyer, David Shaw up there. Don't sleep on David Shaw. I think he can get Stanford where they need to go. I think he can get Stanford into a position where uh, they could be even fighting for a national championship eventually. I and mean, he's got that prowess. He's got the ability to do that. And uh, 
or maybe with Bryce Love. Maybe it's this year with Bryce Love they can do it. They couldn't do it with Christian McCaffrey. Uh, try obviously with when you with Andrew Luck they have with the Oregon the fact that Oregon was so good that with uh, when even when Andrew Luck was there uh, now you have to deal with um, a young guy out uh, there in Alabama if you want to have a chance to, uh, to contend for a national championship. You got you got to get through your Pac-12 schedule first. Obviously if you're if you're David Shaw you're gonna you got to beat Washington you got to beat USC you got to beat Notre Dame uh, you got to you got to win some games so uh, you can't have any slip ups against CSG like they did last year uh, if you're David Shaw so. They have a. Uh, they have some. They have some work to do. Obviously, at Stanford, but I love David Shaw there. The three position, uh, number four was Dabo Swinney. Obviously, we know Dabo. We just talked about his big defensive lineman there. Uh, Kirby Smart and Mark Richt was in there. Uh, I think, well, Mark Richt, I think Miami's, honestly, they were a year early last year. I think this is the year for them really to pop. They might actually make another run for it and not have a slip up like they did last season. I'll look out for Miami as uh, they are going to be, like I said, that, that with their defense. And if they can get Malik Rozier into a ga- position where he can manage games, uh, he, he could be really successful uh, as well there. And uh, for the Hurricanes coming over in that transfer. But, um, that was uh, Mark Richt, and then I put Jimbo Fisher and Jim Harbaugh as well on there um, with Chris Peterson. So a bunch of guys who kind of need to prove themselves, uh, whether it's Fisher at a new school. Chris Peterson still kind of was on the brink so close at, at Washington, and then obviously Jim Harbaugh finally getting a quarterback, Shea Patterson, the transfer, come over and uh, see if they can get Michigan to the promised land that we all think so. I mean, I think they can. If they can go undefeated, maybe um, even if they don't win a, pack, a, 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 a uh, even if they don't win a Big Ten championship game, I think that Big Ten can have a school that can poke themselves into uh, the, f- the playoff without a title game. They might get two teams in the uh, in the playoff this year. So uh, look out for that. All right, that'll wrap it up for the show today. As we'll be back on uh, Wednesday to do some more college football talk for you. Uh, Everybody, have a good beginning of your week. Happy Monday, and uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.